Thank you, Brother Ben. And good morning, brothers and sisters. It's great to be with you. And of course, I do convey to you the love of your brothers and sisters at the Book Road Ecclesia in Hamilton, Ontario. It's great to be with you during these challenging times. And as Brother Ben mentioned in his prayer, what if this is the last exhortation that you hear before the kingdom? We have to all think about that at different times, that one day it will be the last time that we do something, the last memorial service that we have, or the last time that we go to work, or some event that we've planned and prepped for. It won't happen because we're called away to the judgment seat. We can't get caught up with this life. We, we need to have a vision of the kingdom to come, to look forward to, something to give us strength, something to strive for beyond anything that this world has to offer. And that's why I had us read from Second Chronicles chapter 9, because it's one of those chapters in the Old Testament that helps us to build our vision of what the future kingdom of God will be like. As Brother Ben mentioned, it gives the image of Solomon sitting on the throne as a type of Christ in a time of peace and prosperity. The throne that Solomon is sitting on in 1 Kings 2 verse 12, it says that the throne is David's throne. And here in verse 8, the Queen of Sheba says in 2 Chronicles 9 verse 8, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne. So this is David's throne. It's also God's throne. And this verse 8 would be a good place to jot down some cross-references. I'll just quote these. You don't have to look these up, but feel free to jot these down, especially those that are taking notes, the young ones that were mentioned, the, the journals. But the first example would be 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, because this is a partial fulfillment of the promises to David of a son that would sit upon David's throne. And it says in that verse, he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And we know that Solomon did not reign forever, but he was a shadow of the true eternal king that was to come. And this true eternal king is spoken of in Isaiah 9, verse 7, where it reads, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Another verse is Jeremiah 3, verse 17, where it says, At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And we can see the true accomplishment of this prophesied in Revelation 11, verse 15, where we read, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And so Solomon is a perfect type of Christ, ruling God's kingdom, sitting on David's throne, which is in fact God's throne. And we see that during this time of peace and prosperity of Solomon's reign, in verse 23 of Second Chronicles 9, it says that all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. And in the parallel record in 1 Kings, in chapter 4, verse 34, it says that there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth. And even broader in chapter 10 of 1 Kings, in verse 24, it says, And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom. And we know this will be true in the future kingdom as well. We have verses like Isaiah 2, verse 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Many people shall go up. And this is emphasized in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 22, where it says, Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. And the verse we referenced in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 3, verse 17, it continues that Jerusalem would be the throne of the Lord and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
So we have this vision of all nations, even those that are considered strong nations. They are coming to the kingdom of God centered in Israel, in Jerusalem. And this chapter in 2 Chronicles 9 gives us a very specific example of that. The very specific example of the Queen of Sheba coming to visit Solomon. So we're not left with just these broad general descriptions, but the scripture gives us a very clear, tangible example. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 2 Chronicles chapter 9 that the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, and she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem. She came to prove him, or as it means to test him, to put him to the proof. Is he really as wise as she has heard? And it's interesting to think about how would she have heard about this? They didn't have the same ways of getting news out that we have today, but the fame of Solomon was spreading abroad through the world, just as it will in the kingdom age. Now, this queen is from Sheba, and the word Sheba signifies seven, the number seven, or an oath. And when we think about that, especially in the context of the future kingdom, this is highly significant because we believe that the kingdom of God will shortly be established, which will usher in the seventh millennium of God's plan of human history with mankind upon the earth. And that kingdom will be the culmination of the covenant or the oath that God made with humanity through Christ, which he first made to Abraham, that in his seed, in Christ, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So we have this covenant number that is bringing to us here in the vision of the kingdom with Solomon. And when it describes the queen's reaction to what she sees, there are seven distinct pieces that are called out. If we look at verses three and four, the queen of Sheba, when the queen of Sheba had seen, number one, she had seen the wisdom of Solomon. Second thing, she saw the house that he had built. The third thing, she saw the meat of his table. The fifth is the sitting of his servants. We have the sixth, the attendance of his ministers. And there is the cupbearers and also the ascent by which he went up. So let me just go through that again. So you have the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the meat of his table, the sitting of his servants, the attendance of his ministers, the cup bearers, and it mentions their apparel as well, and the ascent by which he went up to the house of the Lord. And when she had seen these seven things, it says that there was no more spirit in her or no more breath in her. It took her breath away to see these things. So we have seven things mentioned about the kingdom of Solomon, but they all point forward to something giving us insight into the future kingdom age. And the first thing, the most important thing, is the wisdom of Solomon. That's the reason that the queen came in the first place, to see the wisdom of Solomon. She came because of his renowned wisdom. It was so extraordinary that it says in this chapter in verse 22 that Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And so it's no wonder that all the kings of the earth sought his presence. And as great as he was, we know that Christ is greater. Christ himself calls out the type of Solomon relating to himself when he says in Matthew 12, verse 42, speaking to the unbelieving Jews at the time, he says to them, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And the queen of Sheba describes Solomon in verse 6 by saying that, Behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou exceedest the fame that I heard. Can we imagine people, what they will say of Christ when they first meet him for the first time? If this was said of Solomon, that everything she had heard, it wasn't even half of how great he was. Just think about the measure of Christ's wisdom and the reaction people will have. As blessed as Solomon was with wisdom from God, and we know he was richly blessed with wisdom. Consider what is spoken of in Christ in Isaiah chapter 11. Let's turn this one up. We'll turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Verses 
And considering the wisdom that Solomon had, let's just read through Isaiah 11, starting in verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, speaking of Christ, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. A spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This will be like nothing the world has ever seen. How amazing will it be to have a righteous king, a righteous ruler in this earth who will not be susceptible to bribery, to smooth words and deception and good lawyers. He won't need to hear both sides of an argument and try and decide who's telling the truth and who's lying. That's what Solomon had to do. Solomon had wisdom, but he had to look at both sides of the two women that had children, and he had to decide and come up with a way to test who was telling the truth. Christ will just know everything, and this world needs a ruler like that. Turning back to 2 Chronicles chapter 9, the next thing after the wisdom of Solomon that's mentioned is the house that he built. And this is the same house as at the end of the verse, the house of the Lord. It's speaking about the temple that he had built. And just physically thinking, truly, this would have been an amazing sight. All of the gold, all of the ivory, the perfectly chiseled stone that was brought to that building site. It would have been an amazing sight. And there will be an even greater temple in the future, as we will be reading about shortly in our readings in Ezekiel we will see that there will be a greater temple that all nations will go up to Jerusalem to worship. And in that day, the words of Isaiah 56 verse 7 that Christ quotes will finally be fulfilled and the house of the Lord will be called a house of prayer for all people. And it will not be the den of thieves that Christ had to deal with in our reading in John. And thirdly, the queen marveled at the meat of his table. So let's turn over to Matthew chapter 24, we're just going to consider this meat of the table. At the end of Matthew 24, there's a a parable in the context of Christ's return. Jesus gives a parable of a servant looking after his master's household. So let's look at Matthew 24, starting in verse 44. Therefore, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This parable portrays a servant providing meat for his household as an activity that's beneficial for the household. He should be giving meat to his household. The other contrast is that he's only serving himself and he's wasting resources on himself and his own lusts. So if we're to be preparing our households for Christ's return, giving them meat, what is that meat that we're to be giving to our household? We know it is the word of God. And think about the spiritual food that Christ will provide to us in the day when he is in the earth the meat of the table of Solomon. We read in Hebrews 5 verse 14, strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And that would be a good verse to put beside Matthew 24 verse 45. It's the same word for meat. When Christ comes, he will have the strong meat of the truth of God's word that 
only he can give because he is the word made flesh. And so we have that in type in 2 Chronicles 7, in the meat of the table, that true meat that will be given out that we need to be doing now as best we can, preparing our households for that return. Let's just turn back to 2 Chronicles 9. We've talked about the wisdom of Solomon, the temple, the meat of his table. And then there are three things mentioned about the different servants of Solomon. There are different words used to describe them. There's the servants, the ministers, there's cup bearers, and particular attention is brought to their apparel. It mentions the apparel twice. Now we should see ourselves in these servants because we hope to be part of those redeemed servants of Christ bestowed with immortality in the kingdom age. And these servants are doing different things. We can see that they're sitting in verse four. We can see that they are attending and that word attendance is Related to the word standing, we can also see that they're cup bears. They're giving to drink of the water of life, the water of the word, or the wine of the new covenant. There's many symbols happening here, but these are servants waiting to do the will of their king. They could be seated, they could be standing, depending on the situation, but they are attentive to their master's words. We think of the angels who stand by and do the bidding of the heavenly father, like Gabriel in Luke 1 verse 19 where he says, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak to thee to show thee glad tidings. And so the saints of the kingdom age will do the same thing for Christ. Zechariah 3 verse 7 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. And we can see in 2 Chronicles 9 also in verse 7, the servants which stand continually before them. We pray earnestly for the day to come when we will stand together as servants of our Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And in that day, what apparel will we have? It mentions apparel twice in this record. And the word apparel isn't really a particularly special word from the definition. It it describes clothing. The word simply means a garment. But this particular word for apparel is only used eight times. It's not the typical word you might see for clothing in the scripture. It's only used eight times, and it's always in significant circumstances. It's mentioned here. It's also mentioned in the record in 1 Kings 10 of the parallel account, referring to the clothing of the servants. But it's also used to describe the clothing of Baal worshippers in 2 Kings 10. It's used to describe the clothing of the wicked that trust not in God in Job 27. It's used to describe the clothing of Christ himself stained with the blood of judgment in Isaiah chapter 63. It is used to describe clothing provided by God to Israel in symbol, which they were not thankful for in Ezekiel chapter 16. And it's also used to describe the clothing of idol worshipers in Zephaniah chapter 1. And the point of all of these is that each of these scenarios, it's a very distinct type of clothing. It's describing a type of person that would be recognizable based on their apparel. You would know what an idol worshiper was by what they wore. Israel should have been distinct among the nations because of what God had done for them. And Christ, of course, is unique and recognizable in his judgments, which he carries out at God's will. And so also these servants of Solomon have apparel that is clearly different and stands out. So how does that relate to us if we hope to be the servants of Christ in that day? What kind of garments are we going to have? Well, let's just turn over to the book of Revelation because we have a progression there in the types of garments that are mentioned. We'll first turn over to Revelation chapter 3. First reference we have is Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4. Speaking of those in Sardis, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. So we have garments now that we need to keep undefiled. And if we do, it says that they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the, th the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. If we keep our garments undefiled as best we can now, 
we will be clothed in white. And what are these white garments? We'll just turn over to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, we see in verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne in their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And here in verse 13, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Garments that have been made white in the blood of the Lamb. And what are these white garments? If we turn over one more time to Revelation chapter 19, we're explicitly told, Revelation 19 verse 8, Speaking of the bride, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We see the righteousness of the saints in these garments. These garments are connected with baptism in washing in the blood of Christ. And they're connected with immortality, having righteousness imputed to us like Abraham. And having our name in that book of life. And Paul uses this analogy when he says in Galatians 3, verse 27, for as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. And put on means to sink into, like clothing, to clothe oneself. Baptism is a symbol of death and resurrection, and we associate ourselves with the death of Christ by putting on the, that, that name of Christ with the hope that we can then be cleansed by that blood and risen with him in the kingdom. And at the resurrection, Paul uses the same terminology. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. It's the same term, put on, to be clothed with. If we're clothed with Christ now through baptism, we have hope to be clothed with immortality when he returns. So how are we going to keep our garments undefiled? as we read in Revelation chapter 3. We have to remember what we read in Matthew 24 in Christ's parable. We have to be faithful and wise servants, preparing our households with the meat of God's word. If we want to be counted among the faithful when Christ returns, we need the steady intake of God's word. We know in Romans 10 verse 17 that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's no surprise if we come back then to 2 Chronicles 9 that we see this theme in this vision of the kingdom. There's a clear emphasis on hearing and words. We see the word hear, which is to hear intelligently, to understand. It's in verse 1, the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon. It's in verse 5, it was a true report which I heard in my own land. It's in verse 6, at the end of the verse, thou exceedest the fame that I heard. And verse 7, the servants continually stand before thee and hear thy wisdom. And it's also in verse 23, the kings of the earth hear his wisdom. All through this record of the future kingdom age, people are coming to hear the wisdom of Solomon or the son of God in type. And we also see words just as much, if not more, emphasized because we have in verse 6, the word words, howbeit I believe not their words, and that's the same word as in verse 5 where it says thine acts, that's the same word as word in verse 6, also report in verse 5, that's also the same, and in verse 2, we have Solomon told her all her questions, that word questions is the same as word, it's all the same, and the word communed at the end of verse 1 is very similar. It means to put words in order. It's only one number off in Strong's. It's a very similar word, uses the same base word. So we have a, a clear emphasis here on hearing. And what are we hearing? We're hearing the words, the words of Solomon. And it's wisdom. We have wisdom in verse three. 
we have wisdom in verse 5, 6, 7. Also then at the end of the record again in 22 and 23, and of course we could look at pretty much any chapter of Solomon and we'll see wisdom referred to. So as we showed earlier, Solomon is a type of Christ and these servants and the Queen of Sheba listen to the wisdom of Solomon. So we must also listen to the words of Christ now and in the kingdom age to come. Peter said in John 6 verse 68, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Those are the only words we need to be paying attention to. But the Queen of Sheba believed only after she had seen. Did you notice that in verse 6? She says, Howbeit I believed not their words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it. And that should remind us of the words of Jesus to Thomas in John 20, verse 29, which would be a great spot to put uh, that beside verse 6. Because Jesus saith unto Thomas, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, just like the Queen of Sheba. But blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's talking about us. We have heard the gospel message, but we have not seen Christ. He's speaking of us in that verse. If we want to be with Christ in the kingdom, ascending up to the glorious temple of the kingdom, we need to believe the things that we have heard. That's how we can develop faith. It's from hearing of the word of God. And so the last thing that takes away the breath of the Queen of Sheba is Solomon's ascent to the temple. In 2 Chronicles 9, the words for ascent and went up are similar, referring to a lofty way or a stairway going up to the temple. In 1 Kings 10, it's a slightly different word for ascent, and it's actually the same word used to describe the burnt offering, the smoke of which ascended to God. And we know the burnt offering was wholly or completely consumed. It showed total dedication to God. And that is how Christ lived his life, in total dedication to his Father even unto the death of the cross. And that's the only reason we have any hope ourselves of ascending up to the temple in the kingdom, of being clothed with pure white garments of righteousness, of immortality, of being part of God's covenant with humanity because Christ overcame the flesh and offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to take away sin. So as we now take the bread and the wine, let us be thankful for the work of the greater Solomon who opened to us the door of salvation that we might wash our garments in his blood that was shed for us for the remission of sins, that we might have a hope to join with the saints who have lived and died in faith throughout the ages. Let us keep our vision on the kingdom strong in our minds that we might have a clear direction in our lives, that we might lead one another, lead our families, lead our ecclesias, that we might be counted as Christ's servants, his ministers, his cup bearers. This may be the last exhortation that we hear before the kingdom. Our experience would tell us probably not, everything just continues, but one day it will be the last. We don't know when Christ will return. Events in the world are happening so quickly we see in the news about peace in the Middle East, which nobody would have ever seen coming, especially things moving so quickly. We see wars happening in exactly the right spots that we would expect them to. We see the nations moving apart and grouping differently according to the scriptures, according to the prophecies. There's nothing left to be accomplished before Christ returns. So we have to remain steadfast. We're in the last stretch of the race. Let's not throw it away now. We're so close. We can overcome the world through Christ and hear the words that we long to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord.